No matter what happens in society and our economics, we always need food. We always need farmers. And those farmers need assistance from aerial application. Flying an egg airplane is not like flying cross country or flying for the airlines. This is a very uh, intense sort of flying. They really do feel that they're trying to save agriculture and they're putting themselves at risk by doing it. just always wanted to be involved in aviation. I learned to fly when I was a kid and, and loved every minute of it and still like to fly. There are these sort of um, two parts of this history, the regional part, but then also this long, longer wartime part. So to understand the history of agricultural aviation, you have to know both how agricultural aviation evolved in the grasslands, Kansas, the Great Plains, those areas, it, in, some, in certain respects um, were entirely different or involved in entire unique ways to other regions of the United States. The industry really got going after World War II. I would say from 1946 to 1948 is when agricultural aviation in this state really uh, sort of um, took off, for lack of a better term, um, and sort of evolved to what we know it to be today. So they, they sort of started um, being interested in aviation and had this wartime background, came home after the war, survived the war, which is an incredible feat on its own, and then decided they loved aviation and wanted to make a go of it in terms of their own a, a, a job, their own companies. My father didn't graduate from high school. He joined the war effort and learned to fly in the Army Air Corps. This was before there was an Air Force. So when he came home, the skills that he had, he could have gone to college, but he hadn't graduated from high school and probably thought that he didn't have, he, he, he could have, but he didn't understand that. College was for rich kids in those days. Many of the, the soldiers that came out of World War II that lived in small towns uh, didn't want to go to college and had their house. So what they could do is they could go learn to fly at the local airports. There were enough pilots that came out of World War II that were looking for jobs and the airlines couldn't gobble them all up. There wasn't enough seats there. So they were just looking for some other way to put that skill set to work. At the end of World War II, the VA, or the GI Bill, they called it then, the Veterans Administration, would allow you to get a private license on with your money. So you could go to college, you could get a home loan, or you could learn to fly. So my father got out of World War II and uh, had a couple of part-time jobs in Denver and didn't like it and went to this little town in Northwest Kansas where they needed flight instructors. My father did that for a couple of years and, and then he was in a uh, gas station and somebody said, told him they've invented a new thing, a new that'll kill weeds, but it won't kill wheat. In the old days, herbicides killed everything. They were primitive crude things, but this guy said, it's a new invention. And my father asked, well, what's it called? And he said, well, it's a funny name. It's called 2,4-D. My father looked into it and there was a guy in Hayes, Kansas that was spraying 2,4-D on wheat to kill broadleaf weeds uh, using a bunch of cubs. And he went down there and said, I want to learn about it. And the guy said, I'll teach you about it, but you got to fly it for me for a year because he needed pilots.
So my father did that, and after a year, he met my mother in, in the hometown where he'd started out, and so he decided to come back, and he bought a Cub and then a Stearman and, and decided that he would set up his own spraying business in 1949. So, so we just essentially grew up riding in airplanes, and then, you know, I, when I was a freshman in high school, I, I essentially had no choice but to go to work in the summers when, you know, and, and I was going to work for my father. It wasn't really an optional thing. And so the ag business by that time was, what, 15 or 20 years old. And, and um, it needed somebody to flag the fields. It used to be in 1950 that a lot of guys had five or six super cubs. They bought the super cubs for nothing. They would haul 60 gallons if they were lucky, uh, maybe 40, depending on which engine they had on it. And they would hire five or six pilots. They were military, uh, there were guys out of the military that were looking for a job and they'd go out and just set up a little operation with not much of loading facilities, even operating off roads out of trailers. And they'd go to work. Back in those days, you drove out to every field and you got out and you walked carrying a flag uh, to mark the field. And so I did that as well as help load the airplanes and just all the work that has to be done on the ground. In the early days, you had human beings down there with flaggers, right? And so you would hire flaggers to go out, scope out a field and get ready. And then the pilot would come and see where the flagger ha held its uh, his flags um, and would kind of align the, the chemical application that way. So the swath lines were very much based on human um, judgment. Well, the last job anyone wanted to have was that flagger job for obvious reasons. You, know, you see the, the beautiful chemicals coming down and you're hoping that the, the ag pilot's not gonna get upset at you for being off, um, but you also don't wanna be exposed. But in those days, to keep your flight instructor certificate, it's not like this now, but it used to be that you had to give so many hours of what's called dual, dual instruction. And my father had a flight instructor certificate and didn't have anybody else to give the dual to, so he'd say, you gotta go, you know, so he could log it in my logbook. It was, it was, it was no more unique to me than riding an automobile. When I, was, when I was younger and I worked around the airport, I used to take farmers up and fly them over their fields in a, in a small Cessna just so they could see what it looks like from the air. I mean, they can walk through it, but uh, from 1,000 feet or 500 feet in the air, they can see where, uh, where maybe their seeds aren't growing or maybe where their weeds present or what's going on in their fields. So after the war, uh, like any manufacturing organization, they had to transition from war production into, uh, into peacetime production. So uh, the company was looking for ways to take the knowledge they had of building those airplanes and transfer that into, uh, into the general aviation market or into civilian aviation. So that's, that was really the transition of the company after the war was, was how do we get into uh, how do we make all this aviation knowledge that we have into something that civilians could use? So that's where the agricultural airplanes, where the, uh, the airplanes people call crop dusters, mm -hmm. uh, came from, was from the original Model 180. While they took the empennage section, the tail cone, uh, and the tail of the airplane, uh, from there forward, they built a fuselage specifically for for aerial, aerial application. A uh, hopper or tank to carry either the chemicals or the seeds you're going to spread. Uh, from there, uh, we developed a, a high lift wing that uh, gives you the ability to fly rather slowly uh, so you can take off and land from those short runways, but also be very stable at low speeds and carry a good weight. For World War II uh, in aviation was really the dawn of business aviation. 
because you had all of these uh, these aircraft, particularly the, the smaller, the B-26, some of the smaller airplanes that could easily be converted to carry people. But that's really where business aviation developed. A lot of the uh, twin engine trainers used as primary trainers in World War II were converted into spray planes or crop dusters. Years ago we were called crop dusters, and now we're aerial applicators. Uh, when they started doing this, the airplanes had uh, uh, containers that held dry powder. The duster part comes from the dry powder. They would, the powder was an insecticide and they would spray the apples or grapes or anything that they were spraying to kill bugs with this powder. And it would dust the field and that's where the term crop duster came from. Uh, when they got out of the military, the GI Bill was, was available to them. And, uh, and they used that GI Bill, used the money to get their pilot's license, which was very expensive and they had they had help from, the, from their GI Bill and, and they could afford to do that. And that, and that, that made them, let them go either crop dusting or flying. A lot of them flew, went into commercial flying Airbuses. And, you know, uh, it, uh, it, was a, it was a great thing for them because when they came out of the war, uh, you know, they, what are they gonna do? You know, what's their, their old job wasn't still there. <laughs> the equipment was, was, to say the least, you know, pretty minimal, <laughs> but it worked. And that's how this industry started, was after the, uh, after the boys in the, in the military came home from the war, uh, jobless, uh, uh, a lot of those guys became crop dusters. You, you didn't have to have anything other than special flying skills and be a little bit uh, willing to, to go outside the normal envelope, maybe. Just, Say, the, say that as best I can, but, uh, but that's how they were. They were, they, were, they were the leaders of our industry and they had to start somewhere. I think that pilots, um, um, they have moved toward a much more safer application uh, process now. Um, and that's through a lot of accidents and a lot of deaths, and it's very risky for them. But there's this misperception about who they are and what they do. The larger arc um, of this industry, from what I can see, has a lot to do with showing farmers, but just the public in general, that they are in fact experts. I had no idea what this was like. As a farm kid, I'd been in on wheat harvest, but spraying the, the ag business, it's wheat harvest from, begins in March, it ends in October. It just, it does not let up. And there is no way to explain that to somebody who's not in this business. I think expertise is a really important to kind of circle back because um, in a lot of ways, um, the public perception of what they do and what they actually do, at least they feel, um, and there's quite some distance there um, or there's a lot of misperception, a lot of fear. That they, they really do feel that they're trying to save agriculture and they're putting themselves at risk by doing it. 90. Five or 97 percent of the stuff that we use has almost no toxicity to humans. You know, we'll spray hundreds of, many hundreds of fields and tens of thousands of acres and do zero damage. I mean, that's the solution is just, if you're in doubt, you just don't spray. You come home. The products that are applied on any crop today are applied in strict compliance with the labeling. The way you make money is you, you, people think of the portion of the flight when you're down close to the ground as being the dangerous part. But in fact, when you're up turning the airplane, you're still at a very low altitude, three or 400 feet uh, typically. 
uh, but you're right on the ragged edge of a stall because the closer you can get to that, the quicker you can get the airplane turned and you've got to jam it around and get back down on the field. When you're in an airplane and you're seven feet off the deck, you have air packing up under the wings. It's actually an effort to push that airplane onto the ground from that point. It's not scary, or if it is, you've made a mistake. You know, if guys always say, did you, have you ever been scared? Well, the answer is if I'm, if I'm scared, I screwed up. You know, when you get in an automobile and you drive down the highway, if you don't like it, you can stop. But once you start down a runway at full throttle and you reach the point where you can't stop anymore because there's not enough runway left, you're going to go flying. And then you're going to go out to this field and you just need to just be alert. You need to be paying attention to what's around you, to what the wind's doing. Either if there's a mechanical failure, that may not be your fault, but other than that, it's on you. It's your, you know, you're the one flying the airplane. You're the pilot in command. We want to portray ourselves as these sober professionals. And for the most part, we are. In fact, obviously, or maybe it's not obvious, this industry, this type of flying, did draw in the early days a few of those stereotypical pilots, the ones that were wild men that had something to prove. But they didn't last. They went broke or killed themselves very quickly. And ag pilots today, they're professional pilots that are doing, and nobody wants a pilot like that. I mean, nobody's going to hire them. It was very important to the, to, the, to the public eye that we stay as clean as we possibly can. And that's part of what this safe flying is all about. We police ourselves for the most part. FAA still has their hand in us. Um, the Board of Ag has a big hand on us. But they know that they actually give us a little freedom to police ourselves. For the most, for the most part, uh, we we kind of take pride in that fact that they would trust us enough to take, they would trust us enough to police ourselves. A pilot under stress is not a safe pilot. I'm kind of like the finger on the pulse, just to just make sure stuff happens. I'm the mom, basically. That's really about how it works, yes. Seems like it takes about four small bad decisions to make a really bad mess you don't want to clean up. Well, you know, if we eliminate that stress or deal with it, eh, maybe we stop one or two of those bad decisions. In small towns in, in the dry part of the world, when it rains, everybody says hooray, not boo, because they know that that water is going to grow crops. You know, it's just a whole attitude and a way of life. Uh, it's a seasonal business, but when the season's on and when there's work to be done, it's got to be done today, right now, when the wind is blowing the right direction and the right velocity. And 
you, you can't schedule it, you can't push it back to next week. Flying an ag airplane is not like flying cross country or flying for the airlines. This is a very um, intense sort of flying. It's more like driving a race car than it is uh, flying cross country. I like to say that I fly, what I do for a living is fly eight feet off the ground at 145 miles an hour, sitting 18 inches behind a fiberglass hopper that's full of pesticide. We get up in the morning and we come out here and roll down to the end of the runway and pour the power to that airplane. And when it, when it lifts off early in the morning, you just, it's like, it's like a, getting a boat out on a lake for the first time in the morning and making the first wake across the lake. It's a feeling that we get almost every morning. You know, you're just you're, you're making that wake across the sky. You're you're breaking that silence for the day, and the world gets started after that. <laughs> so that's probably more common than my situation. That is that it's sort of a family business that the wife works in the um, maybe works on the ground, talking to the customers and ordering the product and dealing with the representatives and the husband flies the airplane. We kind of are a, a unit and that's pretty neat because uh, it, it is a special, uh, it's a special industry. We, there's, our wives have to be uh, uh, special. It takes a special wife to, to, to put up with this business. And when the airplane takes off and, and, and goes to spray a field, and the wife's left at the airport, they don't always come back. You know, sometimes you get this call, well, I'm down in the pasture, you know. Well, at least you got to make that phone call, <laughs> so. It's a, it's a very localized sort of family type of industry. Um, and that um, their knowledge is their own and their expertise is important. A lot of them convert their ag planes into fire deployment planes, and so they go help with fire, forest fires in the American West. Um, that's another way uh, that ag pilots continue to sort of expand their expertise and expand their business at the same time. We make a difference. I mean, there are pests that don't tear stuff up because of these guys. It feels like almost being part of an army. Well, Air Force, let's be accurate. It blows me away when we are really pressed how much good those guys in the airplanes do on those crops as far as saving somebody's production. I am blown away by how much we can do and how short a time thousands of acres, thousands of acres. And, and I've not been in, I've not got to watch a spray run um, in a really big operation where they have two or three turbine aircraft. But I mean, even three or four recip aircraft can, they save a lot, a lot of stuff really fast. You know, we're on a planet with two billion people that are hungry or a billion that are quite hungry. They aren't living the life that we're living, and I, I just like to remind them of that. You just can't feed, you can't feed seven million people without modern agriculture. We go out every day and, and we grow more food for the American consumer in a, in a very economical way. I mean, we help the farmers do that.